everybody. Okay. Uh, welcome back uh, to this next session. We have uh, we have three half hour talks in this session from pardon me from uh, Marco Celotto, from uh, Xenia Kobaleva and Jesus Malo coming up. Uh, so our first uh, talk here is from Marco Celotto uh, from the uh, Panzeri Lab. Uh, this is another talk on the partial information decomposition. We had uh, our first one uh, yesterday, and I highlighted this is a, a particularly exciting area uh, in contemporary information theory. Uh, so let's see what's happening in the Panzeri lab. Uh, Marco will tell us all about the latest. So over to you, Marco. Sure. Thank you, Joe. So, uh, yeah, I'm um, working in the neurocomputational lab from the Italian Institute of Technology, as Joe said under the supervision of Stefano Panzeri. I'm currently my first year PhD. And today I would like to discuss the work that my group and I have been done trying to define and to test both on simulations and on real data, the concept of intersection information. And uh, to do so, we um, use the mathematical frameworks of partial information decomposition or PID. And the data that I will show uh, are from our collaborators at CISA, from the Tactile Perception and Learning Lab in particular. So let's start from the question, the scientific question that led to the definition of intersection information. And to do so, we have to imagine dealing with a perceptual decision-making test where we have a subject, uh, a mouse in the image, that on a single trial basis receives a stimulus that us imagine to have two stimuli in the most simple uh, scenario. And he's been trained to associate a correct choice to each of the stimuli. So in the training phase of the experiment, uh, we might record some kind of neural activity. And if we're good, we record it from a proper brain area where part of this activity will be encoding information about the stimulus. And at the same time, in order to guide the behavioral choice, some part of that activity will be read out. So the key idea behind intersection information is that these two information processing stages, so uh, the sensory coding and the information readout, do not necessarily overlap but some of the information about the stimulus can be lost during the readout, as well as some uh, information that is read out might be not regarding the stimulus. And so intersection information really tries to grasp what is the code that the animal is using in order to solve the task. Let's see how we can attack the problem using partial information decomposition. Here's just a quick review of the main concepts of the theory. And in the case, uh, so the goal of the theory is to decompose the information that a source, uh, that a set of source variables, in this case, I got the stimulus S and the neural response R, carry about a target, the choice. And what the theory says, that is also very intuitive, we have uh, four possible ways in which uh, information is carried by these variables. And in, these are, the, there's an atom uh, of shared information. So information that is available looking independently at the stimulus or at the neural response. Two components of unique information that are available uh, only by from um, the neural response or the stimulus. And in the end, a component of synergistic or complementary information that is really due to the interaction of the variables. And them all together, when summed up, form the whole joint information that stimulus and neural response carry about the choice. So here's a slightly different perspective on the decomposition, but I really just rearranged the atoms to make the next slide more readable. And here we have shared information on the bottom of the, of the diagram. And we also introduced the classical neutral information quantities that are these blocks here. And in particular, I just wanted to like to focus attention for a while on this component that is the information that the neural response carries about the choice this is given by the information that neural response shares with the stimulus about the choice plus a component of unique information and already from here we might be tempted to define intersection information as this atom so once again the information that neural response share with the stimulus and at the same time it regards the behavioral choice but let's take a look at why this isn't really what we're looking for. And in order to do so, we have to enlarge the perspective for a moment to consider two of these uh, PID diagrams looking on the, on the left at the one that we had in the earlier slide with the choice as a target of the decomposition, while on the left at the one with the stimulus as a target. And what we see here is that 
the information that the stimulus share with the neural response really just comes out in this other lattice here. So if we want our measure to really be a subpart of the information between the stimulus and the neural response, the choice and the neural response, as well as the stimulus and the choice, we have to take the minimum between these two atoms that might, in general, be different from a quantitative point of view. And if we do that, once again, we have this nice property of measuring something that is really a subpart of all these three different uh, classical mutual information quantities. So let's now have a look uh, at how the measure behaves on simulated data. Here I have a really simple scenario in which we have a causal uh, uh, information flow from stimulus to choice that is along a line and here i have three uh, different nodes or we can imagine neurons uh, that are carrying the information in uh, each step of the communication we have a little noise transmission of uh, transmission and if we measure the information about the stimulus the choice information and intersection uh, along these three nodes separately we really see an intuitive behavior so information about the stimulus is degradating along the line information about the choice is increasing but as it is desirable for um, intersection information measure intersection information is kept constant and another nice um, thing that we can do is define uh, other two quantities from intersection information that are trivially defined as the differences between classical mutual information quantities and intersection information. And these are the information about the stimulus that is present in the neural response, but will not reach the uh, behavioral choice that is called no readout sensory information and the information that is read out from the neural response, but does not uh, regard the stimulus and is the internal choice information. So moving to another very simple scenario, here we have a um, population of nodes that is conveying all together information from the stimulus to the choice. Here, the nodes are not interacting, but it is not really important from the property I'm discussing here. And the point is that as we measure the joint intersection information and progressively take into account more and more of these nodes, when we measure all the nodes conveying information from stimulus to choice, this quantity, this joint intersection information really reaches the whole information flowing from stimulus to choice. This is nice because if you're measuring real data and we uh, fall into this case of reaching the upper bound given by information going from stimulus to choice with a joint intersection measure, then we know that we're really measuring the whole uh, a part, a section of the information flow that really catches the whole information that is flowing from stimulus to choice. So all the neurons that are somehow necessary in order to uh, perform the behavioral task. And if not, we can take the ratio between the joint intersection information and the information from stimulus to choice and understand how much of that of uh, those populations we are recording in principle. So let's now move to what might be uh, a problem of the measure. And here we're really talking about spurious correlations. So let us imagine uh, to be in this scenario depicted in panel A. And we are taking a measure in a, in a real experiment. And unfortunately, we measure only node 2, R2. So what happens here? We measure a positive, also quite large intersection information. And that even though this node is not being read out to uh, inform the choice. And why that? Because this is a signal correlated with the node R1 that is indeed carrying the intersection information, is contributing to the task. And R1 is then does inform C, and this creates a spurious correlation between R2 and C. So here I'm talking about a null hypothesis for the measure in this, in this scenario. And what we can do is building a surrogate probability distributions from the data we had, imposing the condition of having R2 and C being independent, given the stimulus, that is the variable that is creating the spurious correlation, and recomputing intersection information onto this uh, distribution P star, we, we check whether this is higher or really not than uh, the measure that we originally got. And a nice property of this, of this um, null hypothesis is that we don't really have to recompute intersection information, so compute uh, information atoms twice and then compare them. But uh, I proved that 
uh, the choice information really collapses onto intersection information on this distribution. So this is um, very computationally efficient to build an hypothesis distribution that we can then compare with what we measured in the first place. And on the B panel, I have a um, situation that is symmetric from a mathematical point of view. Uh, then it's probably a bit more peculiar from a neuroscientific point of view. But we have R2 that might get a spurious intersection as a feedback signal from, uh, let's imagine, a population of neurons that is strictly correlated to choice. Here, the construction is analogous uh, from a mathematical point of view. But I just wanted to show you that also this case can give rise to spurious intersection information. And here it's just a plot showing exactly what I said. So uh, in the scenario A that we are simulating, we measure uh, large intersection information in R2. Shuffling simply one of the variables between S and R2 won't work as an hypothesis for the measure because this basically destroys the information between the stimulus and R2 that is an upper bound to the measure. And so we see that here it is almost zero, the intersection if we reshuffle a variable. While if we test for the null hypothesis that we just discussed, this is able to uh, catch the fact that only information in R1 is really uh, only R1 is really contributing to the task and is carrying the intersection information. So moving to a slightly more complex scenario, here I try to mimic the type of uh, situation that we have when we are recording real data. So I simulated uh, the response of 660 neurons carrying information from stimulus to choice, and I just picked a subpopulation of 10 of them. And what we have here are in the, this is a very simple scenario with all neurons acting independently in order to have a clear view of what is happening in terms of the ground truth of the contribution to the task. And here in the square brackets of each neuron, we have on the left the value of the uh, encoding parameter and on the right of the decoding parameter for that neuron. And here both encoding and decoding are linear so let's take this is just to show that uh, the absolute value of intersection information isn't really informative about which neurons are contributing to the task but this is uh, a proper null hypothesis is required in order to understand uh, which are which are are those um, neurons that mostly carry information from stimulus to choice. Here we have a neuron that is as in scenario A. Here we have a neuron as in scenario B, just to show that indeed also this case can give rise to a feedback to a spurious intersection. And the null hypothesis, for example, is able to catch that this one that has a very low absolute value of intersection information is indeed carrying a significant, a significant intersection. And now I would like to, now that we've seen these properties on simulation, I would like to move to real data. And once again, this is an experiment that has been conducted at the Tactile Perception and Learning Lab at CISA. And what our co experimental collaborators did was training a rat to discriminate uh, two different stimuli that are uh, white noises enveloped by uh, sinusoidal waves that might be either at 5 hertz or at, two, at 1 hertz. And these are uh, two, we have two bounces because this is a stimulus that lasts two seconds. So while doing that, our collaborators uh, measured via a microelectrode array um, uh, um, the activity in the viral cortex of the of the rat that is a subpart of the somatosensory cortex and what really makes these two stimuli special is that they on average elicit the same number of spikes in the viral cortex of the of the rat so we're kind of forcing uh, the uh, these neurons to be unable to transmit information about the stimulus via the rate simply the rate and the number of spikes that was emitted during the simulation window so if we now, uh, during the test phase of the experiment, increase the gain, the modulation gain of the waves, so we uh, simply uh, increment the, um, uh, the amplitude of the modulating waves, we find this result from a behavioral point of view. So the animal is getting better and better in uh, performing the task. As 
we increase the amplitude of these waves. Uh, what we did was trying to investigate this um, result from a neural point of view using the intersection information. In order to do so, we uh, compared two different codes. The first one is really just a baseline based rate, rate code, and the other one is a timing code that we built as follow. So, taking the uh, PSTHs of the activity of neurons on uh, so taking the averages of the, all the spiked trains occurring at, for one hertz uh, stimulation and five hertz stimulations, we really see that what the spike train do is following the temporal shape of the stimulus on average. And these are averages taking over almost 730 recorded neurons. So what we did was, was subtracting the five hertz PSTH from the one hertz one in order to build a timing template that is a function that we then uh, made, uh, add, made adding zero average on which we project single spike train in, in the sense that we simply take the dot product between the spike single spike trains and this function. And that is really like the um, zero lag cross correlation between the two. So we will have that those neurons that are more correlated with the one hertz PSTH, so with the one hertz frequency, we'll have a positive score. While those being more correlated with the five hertz frequency, we'll have a negative score. So using this one as a timing feature, we took uh, information theoretic analysis and we measured the stimulus information, the choice information and the intersection carried by neurons on, on all trials here, so for pooled gains. And what we see is that we have a lot of information in timing and very low information in rate when compared to the timing one. We have a lot of stimulus information because we are, once again, we are in the somatosensory cortex of the rat, so this is kind of expected. And here we can also see that uh, on average, uh, choice information is kind of bounding the um, intersection information. So this is kind of a um, suggestion of the fact that the area is, at least this feature is purely, almost purely sensory in the sense that there is low internal choice information in this feature. If we now take a look at the intersection information at separate gains, something nice emerges because we see that uh, in the timing code, we kind of have the same pattern that we had for the behavioral performance of the animal. So we can interpret this saying that as the gain of the stimulus increases, we are uh, manipulating the spike timing precision of, this, of, the, um, uh, of the neurons in the sense that we're making them more temporally locked to the frequency that elicited them. And in this way, then the animal performs better and better during the varying the gain. And we really don't see this kind of pattern for the rate code. So this is a strong suggestion that this is indeed the, the code that the animal is using to solve the, uh, the task. So moving to the last part of the presentation, here we have a very simple classifier that we built in order to uh, identify which was the original stimulus uh, from single spike trains. So what we did was projecting, once again, single spike trains uh, it, on the 5 PSTH and on the 1 PSTH, and we looked uh, at uh, the um, all, all the trials, all the spike trains into this two-dimensional space. So what we see is that tra spike trains that were elicited by one, the 1 Hz frequency are normally more similar, have a higher correlation, a higher projection on the 1 Hz PSTH, uh, while those being uh, elicited by the 5 Hz uh, stimulus have a higher projection um, or zero like uh, cross correlation with the uh, 5 Hz uh, uh, PSTH. And so if we count how many times the, oh, just, um, just a quick uh, precision on the on the plot here, we have that this one is uh, simply the bisector of the plane, so it's not a train boundary. So we are simply, if we measure the performance of the classifier, we are simply counting how many times the um, a spike train is more correlated with the frequency that originated it rather than with the opposite one. And we see that this happens almost 59% of the times. Uh, so we have a 59% of probability of guessing which was the original stimulus from a single spike train perspective. And this is kind of a measure of the spike timing precision of the signals in terms of uh, having a higher correlation over time with the frequency that um, elicited them as opposed to the other frequency. 
So what if now we build the classifier separately on correct and error trials? What we have is that um, this difference in the performance between the classifier on correct trials and on error trials is really a measure of the discriminability of the trials where the animal performed that's correctly and the uh, trials where the animal failed in, the, in associating the stimulus and the choice from uh, a single spec training point of view. And what we have, if we uh, do this uh, kind of construction, taking into account all the neurons together, is that uh, we have a 0.6% increment in the performance of the classifier moving from error to correct trials, which means that the spike trains were, on average, more temporally precise uh, on correct trials rather than on error trials. And this is kind of uh, expected if we say that this is the neural code that the animal is using to solve the task. And this value is significant under a permutation test. But what I really wanted to, um, to show you is that if we now select a subpopulation of neurons with the criterion of only taking those that are significant under the null hypothesis that I previously discussed, and these are almost 23% of the neurons, then this value increases to almost 3.8, which is more, uh, six, more than six times larger. And what we see is that these are the um, uh, center of masses of the clouds of the clouds that I showed you earlier. So this one, this is how these clouds are moving on average. And what we see is that moving from on this uh, subpopulation of neurons from uh, correct to error trials, uh, the spike trains are uh, moving from a, a better spike time in precision, so are more temporarily locked with the frequency that elicited them toward the base actor of the plane. So they are degrading their spike time in precision. And just here, a quick uh, comparison with a uh, subpopulation of the same, same number of neurons, but simply picking the highest, those having the highest intersection information value, and the, this really doesn't reach this, this amount of discriminability. And so simply selecting those who have the highest stimulus information, we really don't find um, increment, a significant increment in the performance of the classifier, which means that are not those neurons that carry the highest sensor information that in principle contribute to the task the most. But this one is the criterion that best uh, uh, allows us to select those neurons contributing to the task. So moving to the conclusions, we showed how we can define um, information theoretic quantities to com quantitatively compare neural codes during a perceptual decision-making task. And in order to do that, we use the concept of PID uh, shared information or redundancy. We discussed how the measure has a kind of desirable properties uh, on simulated data, data, and then we uh, also discussed how to treat the problem of spurious correlation arising uh, via proper null hypothesis. In the end, applying the measure to real data, we showed how the measure was capable of identifying a um, a neural code that somehow explains uh, from a neural point of view the increment in the behavioral performance of the animal with the stimulation gain and how it also allowed to select a subpopulation of neurons that are uh, on which there is a big difference in the spike time in precision so in the in the behavior between uh, correct and error trials so that are somehow leading the animal to fail when they fail in uh, responding to the to the stimulus here I have some brief uh, points on the future work that we can have. So surely test the uh, measure on more complex simulations as well as on more real data. Couple the method with other methods to estimate probability distribution, such as a non-parametric copula is just an example. It's a method that our group is working a lot uh, on in, in order to move to our population coding and take joint intersection information measures over large populations uh, of neurons. And then I just wanted to say that we're also working on trying to define other uh, measures of, uh, inf of information theory using uh, similar concepts taken from partial information decomposition. So 
a quick thanks to my group, uh, both in Genova and Rovereto, uh, for supporting me and giving me feedbacks on the work, to the experimental collaborators at CISA that collected the data, and of course to Stefano for supervising the work as well as allowing me to, to work on this project. And of course, thanks to you for your attention, and I hope I still have some minutes for a couple of questions. Okay, thank you, Marco. I'll uh, give you the uh, audible applause. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, that was a very good time. We've got uh, probably a full five minutes for, for questions there. Um, wait, wait, what we don't wait. have is it any questions on the Ask a Question tab. So I'm going to start with a question while hopefully we get a, a couple more in there. Could you come back to, let me see, I think it was, I think it was slide five. Sure, let me just, can you still see the presentation? No, no, I'm only getting black I don't know if, at the moment. Okay, sorry, I don't know if I accidentally, wait, wait, I will try to share it once yeah. again. So here, uh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yeah, thanks to everyone for putting the, uh, the virtual applause in. That's really nice to see every time as well. It certainly makes me feel less uh, less like a loner in giving the physical applause. <laughs> Wait, um, I tried to share the whole screen because I don't know why it wasn't giving me. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see the presentation now? Uh, I can see your editing screen and, and that's fine. We can just mm -hmm. run with that. Uh, do you want to come back to slide five? Sure. Here it is. Okay, something I missed here is about the conservation along the causal chain. I didn't really completely understand that. Uh, okay. Can you perhaps explain it a bit better why why this should be conserved? Because um, uh, because the interaction information here it's not necessarily smaller than the mutual information between S and C. So uh, I, I feel like there must be some other assumptions here that I'm missing as to why it should well, be conserved. Intersection information is indeed smaller than uh, information about stimulus and uh, and choice, if I understand that correctly. This is a subpart of all three quantities. Uh, so information between S and R, C and R, and S and C. Right. And the point here is really that in order to uh, get to the choice information about the stimulus, I had to pass along all the three nodes so if we have like a larger information uh, if we have a large information about the stimulus here then uh, we we know that if it got to inform choice it had to pass through the following uh, nodes as well so in this simple i'm not saying that this is a general property if we have larger uh, more complex uh, interaction schemes, but simply in this scenario, if we um, if we have uh, that some intersection information, so some information about uh, stimulus reaching the choice is, for example, measured in the node three, it had to necessarily pass through the previous nodes. And so we cannot have like more in information about the stimulus that is informing the choice if it wasn't present in the previous nodes, as well as the previous nodes somehow bound the information about the stimulus that can reach to the choice. Yeah. And okay, okay. that no, that, that's fine. I think part of my misunderstanding of what the interaction information was, I, I didn't realize it was defined specifically. I think I missed it was defined specifically from your diagrams there. I thought it was the uh, the interaction information, the one that's oh, no, no, no. Maybe the I... sort of co-information. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I uh, maybe I missed, uh, I said no, that, it wrong. Maybe okay. this intersection is defined as <laughs> as near. Now, as uh, as luck would have it, our next question comes from Xenia, who's going to be the next speaker. So I'm going to invite her on screen, and she can ask you okay. uh, the question and just stay on screen. Um, so the question is, I'll read it out to you as she comes up. Do you do you think your method would be applicable to whole brain data? Uh, well, do you want to clarify uh, any of that, so, Xenia, now, now that you're here before, yeah, yeah. Uh, before Marco answers it? No, I think that's all. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So with whole brain data, do you mean like um, techniques uh, such as fMRI or EEG? Yes. 
where you collect data from large population of neurons? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, indeed, we are using the method also for experiments involving EEG. And as long as you can build probability distributions from, as long as you can define neural features from which you could, in principle, measure stimulus information as well as choice information, then the measure is properly defined also uh, also the intersection information. And I don't have, unfortunately, the, the, the plots here, the results here, but it seems to work quite well also on this kind of data. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, well, that's about, that's about time. So let's thank Marco again. <laughs>